It's London, it's World War II, and a group of children are evacuated to the countryside to Eel Marsh House. So the time change is certainly refreshing from, uh, you know, we've got Victorians to Brits fighting for their lives and just a really refreshing change because, you know, I felt like if it had carried on with that Victor or Victor <laughs> Victorian, <laughs> ah, that gets really hard to say after you've done a lot of talking for a while. <laughs> But if it had kept up that Victorian kind of stuffiness and it just probably wouldn't have worked for me and uh, not that I'm saying this film did work for me but you'll find out more if you keep watching. And so yeah you go from this kind of, it's like a fear factor of the sense of these people think they're safe from all the bombs and everything that's going on in the war to just something even more terrifying that's around the corner in the countryside. <laughs> the downside to the time period of it being set in World War II means they had to create this soppy romantic World War romance <laughs> and it just to me just felt unnecessary and it brought in a very unnecessary character which was played by Jeremy Irvin. It felt like it was there just to create this attachment and it doesn't work, you know, there's this story of love, you will be attached and you will just think, oh, and you'll emphasise and you'll uh, strike up all these emotions and it doesn't. As soon as there's danger, I just, I really didn't care about that attachment. You can't make danger more upsetting when the viewer doesn't care about what's going on with the romance and the people. <laughs> They'd probably just want you to die, you know? <laughs> so I will, I will admit Phoebe Fox, uh, the main character, does keep you watching. It's, she is quite a delight as well as Helen McCrory uh, of uh, recent Peaky Blinders. So I was very excited after recently just watching series two of Peaky Blinders. I thought, oh, she's going to be great. You know, it's another sort of period piece. So she's really going to be in her element. And she was a delight to watch. So those two really kept grip and kept me from going into a coma, really. Because this film really does start brilliantly. It starts very atmospheric, it really sets a mood, and it, you, it, it does create some very terrifying moments. There were moments where I was sort of like, coming into myself and I thought, yeah, that, that really worked well. But unfortunately, I think because these atmospheric moments work so well, whenever they try to do like a typical jump scare, it just comes across as really cheap. So I personally think the phobia that I have, if you don't know about this already, kept me going. I have a huge phobia of the woman in black. She terrifies me. She made me cry out for my parents at the age of 15. <laughs> She, you know, she has really damaged me. <laughs> I went to see this show when I was younger and it ruined me. I thought she was absolutely terrifying and so when I watched the first film I was like, I'm going to probably just ruin the clothes I'm wearing. <laughs> But it turned out that I didn't and I wasn't impressed because I think I really do admire the stage show just so much that I can't enjoy these films. As it goes for The Woman in Black and as it goes for this sequel, I just don't think it will ever live up to the stage show and it will never quite be right the story of The Woman in Black because they just can't seem to find the right balance between atmosphere, emotion and shock. I'm actually really terrified to leave this room now. I feel like she's like right behind the door. <laughs> See, I can't even talk about it without terrifying myself. Talking about the woman in black makes me more terrified than watching the woman in black <laughs> films. <laughs> I terrify myself more than the film managed to. 